Please check out our sponsors NordVPN for the best in online security. It's the best VPN on the market and you can try it risk-free now with a 30-day money-back guarantee by visiting nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand. That's nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand and it's risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Hello and welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast. My name is David Edgar, I am your host as always and it's something a little bit different this week with no game to look back on due to the international weekend. We asked our chief executive tier subscribers over on Heart and Hand for some questions and we'll go through these today. Yes, Rangers might not have a chief executive but thankfully we've got a few over there and these are the questions that they came up with so I will turn it over to them. First of all, from David Gardner, he says, The relationship between the club and the fans is at a real low point. There's no trust in the manager or players that they can win the league, and there's no leadership from senior management or board level. How can the club gain the trust of supporters back? Season ticket money seems like a tax rather than having to to pay to enjoy watching Rangers at the moment. You don't lose trust overnight and nor can you regain it back overnight. That's just a fact. And in fact, it'll take you longer to get it back than it'll take you to destroy it. So there's that. There is no quick fix. There's no swing for the fences. And to be honest, any attempt at a swing for the fences to just do it in one leap, if you like, to mix my metaphors, isn't going to work either, David. The issue that that we have at the moment is we are starved of success, obviously, and success would help that. But it's more than that. I think that there's been so many wrong decisions made, uh, certainly in the past three years. You can argue longer, but certainly in the past three, since we won the title. And Rangers have just got so many things wrong. There is no faith that the people who were there will, will get it right. That's simply a fact. And... It has to be an understandable fact to the people who are in charge. Strangely, I think that when business people get involved in football clubs, and not merely, not merely at Rangers, by the way, I don't want to just indicate that this is a specific Rangers problem, because it really isn't. We've seen it before at other clubs, that especially when people who are supporters get on the board, that they, they sort of don't hold themselves to the same standards they hold themselves to in their businesses. And by that, what I mean is that there's almost this acceptance of, well, it's really difficult and we're trying our best. And I just think, I look at the guys uh, who are in charge of football clubs and think, you wouldn't put up with that attitude in your day-to-day business, the one that made you successful. So you have to be ruthless. You've got to make decisions that might not necessarily be popular uh, if they're the right ones. And at Rangers, things have just, I think, been done that clearly have been proven not to have worked. So what we need is a complete root and branch change. We need a change of culture. We need a change of style. I think that that's why fans are screaming out for a new CEO to be appointed. The new CEO coming in is not a magic wand. It will not fix everything and it will not fix everything quickly. That's just a fact. And the new CEO will probably make stumbles as well. And it'll be difficult because, through no fault of their own, they are going to find themselves with a support who you say have very little, who, as you say, have very little patience for mistakes at the moment. So it makes it a more difficult job. Equally, though, there are some some plus points to coming in at the moment. If you're a CEO, you have the opportunity to put your own stamp on the business. You have the opportunity to put your own plans in place because there's nothing there at the moment. Let's be honest. There's, there's nothing there. What I think they have tentatively been called a plan in the past has been exposed and dissolved on contact with reality. So what we need is, if you like, that sense of purpose back, I think, firstly, from a chief exec, that sense of purpose, that sense of belief that you mentioned. And if we can get that, then we can begin to to get on the right track and start to move forward. But there are too many things that have gone wrong for, if you like, that trust that you mentioned to be to be automatically coming back. People will be more reticent to do that. However, as I say, 
they there are some good things in terms of the support are very loyal. They've still been turning up. They'll continue to. They'll continue to buy tickets. So it's not, if you like, that particular debacle that you might have you might have seen at other clubs where it's worse than it is at Rangers. At the moment, it's a question of inertia. There's nothing really been happening for a while. Uh, I mean, what six months now since since Vice Grove left? They hasn't been replaced. So what we need is a sense of dynamism and hopefully the people coming in can help provide that. It will be a long-term process to get that trust back, and the best thing that can help do it is success on the pitch, but stability of it. Rangers fans, I think, are a bit fed up of every day waking up to something else. That needs to go. I think, you know, again, it tends to happen when you're not being successful, but that needs to go. Rangers need to feel like we're being run more professionally than we have been. Martin Sutherland says, hope all is well, mate. I tend to trust my gut with managers, and if a team can get out of a funk, I don't think Clement will manage to shake it, which is what I felt with Beal and GVB. I always had faith that Gerard would get us there. What's your gut instinct at the moment? I think that Clement's had, we're, we're a year now since he was appointed, and it's been a roller coaster. It's been absolutely up and down. He said to me after six months about Philippe Clement, I just, well, absolutely brilliant doing everything right and if you said to me now then it's mm, doubt so I think he's done enough to be given the benefit of the doubt but I think it would be unfair and disingenuous to suggest that doubt isn't there because there have been things that that fans have looked at and went "Mm, don't agree with that not sure about that I think there is an acceptance among Rangers supporters that he's not exactly been given the strongest hand to play so I think there is that that realization there for him but there are things that he needs to do to help convince everyone that, yeah, actually, we're in the right hands here. And, of course, you know, winning uh, a victory in an old firm match would certainly help a great deal. So there are challenges ahead for him. I don't think anything would be served by making a change at all. And this is one of the things that's maybe a bit frustration in in the modern social media, social media, social media aged discourse, which is that you tend to be pushed towards a position it tends to polarise and you tend to have to say I 100% back him or no he's wrong and we should sack him tomorrow and what can happen is if you issue any criticism then people will say oh so you want him sacked no not at all um, I go back to the word stability again I think Philippe Clement provides that but that doesn't mean that there aren't challenges to be met and questions to be asked and then we have a better understanding and idea of where he is at the end. I was the same with Gerard, and a lot of that was to do with one, the situation we were in before it, two, his personality. So it maybe wasn't strictly based on what I was seeing at times. But I think there was always a, a clear sense of direction, purpose and plan there, uh, which which helped. Didn't always get executed perfectly, but I think you kind of saw where we were going a little bit more than we have done. Equally, though, as I say, Clement has had a lot of stuff to work with, you know, the, the wage bill, which was out of control and having to be trimmed, and uh, working with a level of players who, who are not great. That's that's what it comes to. I mean, it is, I think, uh, an average squad. I don't think it's a great squad. I don't think it's a terrible squad. I think it's somewhere in between. So uh, he doesn't, as I say, have you know a, a, a lot of great cards to play. But there is no, for me, there's no point in making a change now. We've got to get out of that cycle. And he certainly, I think, will be given, regardless to the end of the season, to, to turn things around and... Uh, you know, pushes in the right direction. I mean, turn, I don't mean turn things around as we sit today. I just mean the overall direction of travel. Uh, and hopefully, if we could get, you know, a couple of good players in in the January window and push on from there. The squad is short in a number of positions, I think. But it will take probably two or three windows to, to get that up to the, the level that it is required. Stephen Johnson, do you think the manager should be focused on making the team better than the sum of its parts or sticking with the system which might work once he has the players to implement it? Right now it seems to be the latter. Yeah, I think that's a modern thing about coaching that everyone these days seems to be wedded to their philosophy. And it's just the way it is. That's that's just what is the current modus operandi in, in coaching. And for a lot of coaches, that I, I don't 
think it's purely dogmatism, although it can spill into that. I think it's often just a genuine belief. No, this is the way we will get results by playing like this. For me, and I asked the manager about this uh, after the Leon game, I, I think that you need to take into account what's available to you. So uh, at the moment, for example, Rangers, our attacking play is very reliant on the wide players in this system in the 4 2 3 1, which is understandable. And we're down to McCausland and Cherney is the only fit to. We do have players who can play in that role, but I always think you lose a bit when you are playing, when I hear that phrase, and he can play in there. Um, I think you always lose a little bit if it's not someone's out-and-out out position, and you also lose them from the position that they play in. So, yeah, for me, I think you need to look at what you've got rather than trying to fit square pegs into round holes. But, as I say, as we see right across football at the moment... The, the current fashion, the current ideology is that, no, you come up with the way you want to play and you stick to it. And managers will say, and I think it's quite a fair point, that, yeah, because we drill to that, that's, you know, everyone should know what they're doing in that system because that's what we work on day in, day out in training. And then someone should be able to step in and play that role. And I think that, that you know, that's a fair argument. But for me, for example... Would you maybe think about switching to a three-five-two for certain matches? Not for all of them, not Ibrox or whatever. But when you don't have a great selection of wide players to choose from due to whatever injury, suspension, form, whatever, would you then maybe go and think against teams? Leon, that was the match where I asked the case in point. Would it have helped to maybe have Casemiro in there, go to a three at the back, have an extra body in the middle of the park, and be able to hopefully choke some of the supply to their front men? I don't know, I'm an amateur. It was just a, you know, when I looked at the squad, that's how it seemed to be. But in the end, managers these days, as I say, will generally go, no, this is what we do and we'll continue to do that. Sandy McClary says, I know it's important to take our time to appoint the right personnel, but how important would you say it is to people in place, namely a chairman and a CEO by the AGM? <laughs> to be honest, Sandy, the AGM's an arbitrary day. It's important to get somebody in as soon as possible. It's really that simple um you know we've been without one for for six months it's far too long to go without one for any business but certainly for a club of our size and the situation we're in so yeah it'd be important to have them in for the agm it'd be important you can pick any day it's important to have them in now and the sooner the better Andrew Whiteside, I'm curious about the role of John Halstead in Rangers. I read a while back that he wanted a bigger role at the club. Do you know anything, David? No, Andrew, I don't. So there you go. <laughs> I don't know too much about John Halstead. What I would say is if he wanted a bigger role at the club, then bigger roles are available at the moment. So if he was interested in doing that, he would get the opportunity to do that. Graham McGregor, hi David. If, and it's a big if, we're on the right track with recruitment finally, how many more windows do you think we need to have a squad capable of winning the league I asked an agent over the summer and he reckoned three including the summer window passed and I can't say I disagree unfortunately the player types we are targeting now in my opinion are more encouraging than the English market where more often than not we've come unstuck your thoughts please I agree with your agent friend minimum three I think to have a squad that's really up to it because it isn't simply about getting a good 11 as we all know these days with the amount of matches etc and different types of games different types of challenges you need different types of players for them so yes for me I think you're looking at the January and the summer window and that's getting a lot more right than we have historically we have had I think in terms of the summer uh, an influx of young players where you can kind of look at and say yeah okay I get it and again one of the things we're guilty of is saying when a player arrives, even a young player, that that's as good as they're going to be. And it's like, well, no, they should get better. That's the whole point of it, especially when they move to a bigger club with better coaching, better facilities. They should develop. They should improve with experience, etc. So um, the player that you have in 2024 is maybe not as good as the player, the same guy, but the player in 2025, that's not an unreasonable suspicion moving forward that players can improve year on, year out. But I do think we're short in a number of, of areas. I still think there's a lack of pace about the side. I still think we need to improve that. We're not quick enough, in my opinion. It was really uh, prevalent, I thought, against uh, a couple of the teams who played at home recently and only beat by you know, a couple of goals when maybe it could have been more because when we got into the, the two-goal lead and when the teams pushed up, 
we had previously power on the break to just go with the three or four guys who would just outstrip them and take the ball up and create chances and we didn't have that we didn't have that so much so I still think pace is a key component for us moving forward but I also agree with you on the English market now if you can get good players from England you do it but my concern about any player playing in England at any level is they will be paid more than their equivalent in Europe that's just a fact there's more money in the English game so straight away you're paying a lot of money out in wages to get them to come up here and then you've got to go well what's the return on that investment are we going to get bang for our buck from that guy or should we be targeting other markets you know the English Championship there's a lot of players in there who've come up to Scotland over the years not done well but they're on big big money because they're on big big money down there so I think the, the wider the our scope is and the more players we're looking at then the better 100% Jim Lamb, we have a number of players who have come through or are currently playing for the B team, e.g. Rice, Lovely, Stevens, King and Lowry, etc. Do these players have a realistic chance of making the breakthrough or is it the case that they are not good enough? Well, the manager sees them in training every day and here's the thing, right, that we sometimes forget as fans. Managers pick the 11 that they think is going to help them win the game on Saturday because that's the be-all and end-all. That's the most crucial thing. Every manager knows it. A bad run and you're at the job centre. So if they see something in these guys then that will help them win football matches, then they'll pick them. It is difficult though at Rangers, and you could argue that the short-term considerations, which will always be there at Rangers, particularly in a situation like right now, are not conducive to bringing through players at the kind of level that we want because there is no patience. They have to come in and hit the ground running. They have to come in and provide something. I think McCausland, though, is a good case in point on what you can do, which is at least bring in somebody who can be a squad player. That's the minimum, I think, that the youth system should be doing, and it hasn't been doing for a number of whiles. Someone who can play, who can come in and offer. Brilliant if someone comes in and is a superstar, that would be absolutely tremendous. But if they don't, then they should at least be able to be somebody that could play without it being an absolute disaster for the side. There's a lot of cultural things around us as a club, you know, historically for the last you know, 30, 40 years. We've been traditionally a buying club and it's a hard thing for us as supporters to shake uh, that, that, you know, we need to, to bring in youngsters, give them a bit more time to develop. It is a harsh environment and that will never change. So, yeah, you need to protect youngsters. That's what you hear a lot from managers of all stripes. You know, you need to But equally. I'm not sure they get any better playing in the B team. Something for years hasn't worked about our B team or about our reserve, whatever you call it, youth development, right? Because the path line, it's, it seems to me at times that if someone comes through, that's the anomaly rather than someone not coming through. So I think it's something that needs to be worked on, needs to be looked at, and maybe even radically looked at. Is this working for us? If not, what should we do? Should we do something that's, that's totally outside the conventional thinking? Maybe, I don't know. But it's definitely something to to consider moving forward. Here is an excellent question from Mark Davidson. He says, I've heard you mention on the Daily Update about the facilities at Rangers and that there was no excuse for players not to be in shape. I had a conversation with a work colleague whose nephew was signing his first professional contract about two or three years ago now. He had offers from Rangers, Manchester United, Chelsea and Arsenal. Him and his father got tours around the facilities of each club and although he ended up signing for Manchester United purely because of the financial aspect, they said that Rangers training facilities were better than the other three clubs they visited and that amazed me considering they are Premier League clubs. How good are they and have we actually got something we can use the best in class term that we frequently band about being? The training facilities at Ibrox are spot on, absolutely first class. There is zero excuse for any player to do it. Now, clubs in England might have bigger facilities, you know, in terms of more more land, more space uh, and more people working at them. But they wouldn't necessarily be better. It's the same equipment that's in the two places, you know. It, it, it's the same stuff. The Rangers facility is incredibly comfortable. Um, you know, the, the the chefs there who to look after the players are you know really top ones and will will cook anything that is specified in a player's specific diet. It's that much detail goes into it. All the stuff is there. Of course, we heard Philippe Clement, the manager complaining last year that the players didn't use a lot of the facilities or there the were machines there, you know, to, to help pre- prevent injury that were never, there was dust on them, 
etc. So, yeah, the Rangers training facility is excellent. It has been... It, it was allowed to get into disrepair like when Warburton arrived and a lot of the stuff then was, was outdated and whatnot, but it was improved dramatically under Stephen Gerrard and f- throughout that, and that's one of the things Ross Wilson, who listeners will know I'm not a big fan of, but he did get that right. Money was spent on keeping the facilities up to date. So they're totally up to date. So no, there is zero excuse for a Rangers player to not be as fit as an opponent. And I don't care if it's an opponent who plays for uh, a club, a richer club, a club in a bigger league. Uh, he is training with the same stuff you are. You know, that that is that simple. So it's a dedication job at that point. But the facilities at, at Rangers are absolutely first class, yes. And for me then, it is a case of... Right, lads, well, you've got every opportunity. Now, facilities probably won't make them more talented, unfortunately, but it should certainly mean that they are, as you say, fit to, to take on any challenges. And incidentally, just to kind of tie your question back to the youth development question that we spoke about earlier, I think that's a key point you mentioned there. They sign for Man United purely because of the financial aspect, and I totally understand that. Um, you know, a kind of vague relative of mine is, is Billy Gilmer, and when he signed for Chelsea, the money that was on offer was extraordinary. They have to take it. You know, it's life-changing, not just for them, but their entire family. The English clubs can afford to pay them money that, to be honest, we as a club would consider good first-team money and clubs out with the old firm in Scotland would balk at playing. And they're 16, they might never play a first-team game. English clubs can do it and Scottish clubs can't, which means the best talent will get hoovered up down south. And I think that's something that the authorities need to look at because they are harvesting talent in England and it, it isn't fair and in a world where you've got PSR rules designed for fairness all those kind of things that hamper us you know even as a, a club in Scotland then I think you've got to say well okay this is you know you, you are using this wealth to to, to to basically make sure that there's no value at all for con- clubs in smaller countries providing uh, youth players facilities and 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 having a youth system in general because the best ones will always get snapped up elsewhere so all you're doing is developing players for buttons because the compensation payments are buttons to go and then play in England. Stuart McKee said, is it not time to get ex-Rangers players more involved in the coaching set up at the RTC? We've tried going the other way with coaches from the outside and I don't think we've got anywhere. We have an identity problem that our players don't know what it is to be a Ranger. We need a winning mentality in there and people who know what it takes to win at Rangers. In the next few years, we'll be coming into an era there won't be any ex-Rangers heroes players of one things with Rangers. Neil McCann is director of football with Ferguson Thompson and Kenny Miller and round about the youngsters for a start. And here's a wild shout. Neil Doncaster for chief executive already has relationships with the other clubs in the league and we'll know where the bodies are buried. He's a dick though. I hope you're joking about the latter one. Um, uh, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and suggest that you're joking with that one, Stuart, because quite frankly, I would rather piss in my own hands and wash my face with them than have him at the club. The uh, issue with Neil Doncaster, by the way, isn't just that he you know, calls the tune on behalf of another club, which is a suspicion we as Rangers fans have, that might not be true, that might be a paranoia, but one suspicion that I think has been proven absolutely time and again is that he isn't very good at the whole chief executiving lark, and that's why they keep running into disasters. So, uh, as I say, I, I will put that one down as a joke to hopefully save you from some, uh, I was going to say good-natured ribbing in the, the comments afterwards, but uh, maybe not. Yeah, in terms of bringing in, now it's not a panacea, right? And again, this is, when you say something people tend to jump to one extreme or another of it. And what you'll get are people saying, ah, if we get the youngsters in that, that'll, if we get the, the ex-players in with the youngsters, that'll definitely teach them. And you get other people saying, well, if they're not good coaches, then it doesn't matter. And there's an in-between, as there always is. There is an authority that comes from ex-players, show me your medals, basically. There is an authority that comes from these guys. There is also that knowledge that they have that, with all due respect, a coach, a brilliant coach from youth football who hasn't played at the highest level simply cannot have 
They cannot have insight into that. They haven't done it in the way that the, these guys have. So you have a balance, right? You don't just go, okay, right, we're sacking all these coaches and we're bringing in all these ex-players and they'll be the coaches, right? You don't do that. But nor do you, do you say, well, no, we're not going to have any ex-players. You get a mix, you get a balance. And absolutely, I think it, it helps the people who are technical coaches, guys who are youth development experts in the field, who know everything, you know, the 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 latest trends and whatnot and you get guys who have maybe got a different thing to offer which is right when you get into the first team this is what you're going to face these are the challenges right and here's how i handled it experience here's my experience and hopefully you can take this and learn something from it it's a balance and it's not one i think we've got right at the moment Stuart. Uh, Richard McClucky, I honestly think that Clement is getting a stupidly rough time regards expectation versus reality. The situation we are in right now is the result of years of decline and poor decision from previous regimes, both executive and coaching, but Clement is being held responsible for much of those decisions with no context. I also feel that the fan base is more influenced by a critical media who love to play on the word crisis than they'd care to admit, and it seeps into a feeling of doom. You've said many times this will take more than one window to fix, so are the support expectations ridiculously high and unflinching, or should we keep those expectations in demand? The current squad rise above their ability? That's a good question. Our expectations, and this is one thing about the level of expectations, and when people try, and, and I've seen this argument, and I've heard, and I've listened, and I've heard friends have it, uh, have this argument about expectations versus reality. And one of the things that I've heard said is, well, these are the expectations and they won't change. And that's correct. So you kind of just have to deal with it. And the other side I've heard, and this point is true also, is, well, we can expect all we like. That won't make a damn bit of difference to what happens on the park. So you just have to accept that what you're seeing is what you're seeing. Again, it's become a bit of a theme of this pod. I think there's extremes. I think there is, no, these are my expectations. I will never, ever deviate from them. And I will not look without context. Rangers should be winning. End of story. If they're not, I'm going to be angry. Right, in which case you are probably going to be angry at times this season because, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think it's a great squad and expectations, the weather, it doesn't matter. In the end of the day, the amount of talent in the squad will more than likely transfer to roughly where it should finish in the league. So whether or not, as an individual, you then you know just get incredibly frustrated by that is kind of down to you. I mean, we're all frustrated when we watch the team play really poorly. Um, I think there does need to be a kind of realistic appraisal of it. I saw, for example, after we played Leon, somebody said, you know, Leon are seventh in the French league. And I was like, well, how's that relevant? Where do you think we'd be with a squad in the French league right now? <laughs> you know, no offence, but we we wouldn't be troubling the scorers at the top of it, let me tell you. Um, and I think that there is that element of it that people have an expectation level that simply can't be matched by what we currently have. But you shouldn't downgrade your ambitions, though, because then you get into the thing of saying, ah, well, they're not that good, so yeah, well, it doesn't matter if we finish second or third. The lower your expectations, then, if you, you aim high and you don't hit it, you're still going to hit reasonably high. If you aim medium and don't hit it then you're finishing low um so i think there needs to be context in any discussion because you're right the situation as it is is not totally of clement's creation and jesus christ you know look at who's he working with you know who, do, who does he go in and speak to on a day-to-day -day basis um in terms of up above him there's nothing there so i think we do have to take that into account but it won't last forever and in the end, it's it's how we feel, you know. And if the frustration is such that that people feel, then then yeah. And certainly, look, moods be they positive, negative, or in the middle, get influenced by those around us. So if if the general prevailing mood is negative, then people are going to get caught up in that. Um, I think one of the things that doesn't doesn't help is that when people have an alternative viewpoint, they get screamed at. That, I think, is, is unfortunate. If you feel one way or another about Rangers, that is totally fine. That's totally up to you. If someone else feels different, you do not have the right to turn around and scream and ball at them. You can debate with them, 
you know, you can, but you see it all the time online, someone says something positive, oh, you're a happy clapper, somebody says something negative, oh, you pissed your knickers, there's an in-between, and I think you've got to be realistic about it, about where this team is this season, but you should never stop, though, saying, and what are you doing to get it better? I I know what this team, or I think I do, right? I I think I've got a fair idea of of what this team's capabilities are. And that means that, you know, I I have on some level accepted that things might not go brilliantly. Doesn't mean I'm not upset when they don't. But it doesn't mean either that I'm not going, okay, this isn't good enough. Okay, I accept that it currently isn't good enough. But what are you doing as a club and as a manager and as players to make it better? Those, I think, are pertinent questions, Richard. J. Smith. Given Craig Robertson's upcoming departure on top of all the other vacant positions required, I think it is time for us to try the ex-player as DOF head of operations method, similar to what a lot of clubs do in Europe, and they have that in place. Not necessarily an ex-ranger, but I do feel it's necessary for someone like that in place next to Coppin and the other execs. What's your thoughts? Cheers. Jay, I don't understand why we don't do this here, and we're one of the very few countries in Europe who don't now... In Scotland, we don't particularly love the director of football model anyway. Um, clubs in the top five leagues will all have a sporting director, a technical director, whatever you want to call it, right? And we don't. And it's like, I look at us in Scotland and I look at other leagues and I think, I'm not necessarily sure we should be confident our methods are the right ones. Just saying. And I don't understand why we don't have ex-footballers with a brain, right, who you know are intelligent. It's something I think we should be looking at as players are coming to the end of their careers. I think players should be looking at that. At the moment, they don't because there aren't these opportunities. But can they go and study part-time as they're finishing up the play? Can they get business degrees? Can they get you know things that will point them in the right, the right direction? Then when they come into clubs, they need mentored and they need to be, you know, people show them the ropes kind of thing. And again, because we're starting with this, this would be a brand new thing and a whole change of, of culture for Scottish football. But for me, it would help enormously because, again, you've got guys with the experience of being in certain situations, of being aware, of knowing what makes footballers tick. And I think it would be common sense. I, you know, there, there are plenty of ex-Rangers out there, incidentally, just even if you want to limit it to Rangers, who are successful business people out with football and have gone on out of football to have success. And, yeah, to me, I, 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 I just don't necessarily see the negative side the argument can be well if they're not up to it that's the same for anybody anybody if they're good you know that's the key thing no matter what their experience is but i would suggest that the experience they have could be hugely beneficial jamie thompson says where does Coppin fit in when we approach uh, we appoint a deof sporting director etc surely recruitment would fall under the newly appointed can we justify paying a head of scouting salary um yeah, I mean, he would be working in tandem with... No, I I think you need to have... I, I don't dislike the director of football recruitment. And I'll tell you the reason why. Ross Wilson at an AGM said, you know, I get the blame, but it's not me that, that brings the players in. Well, who did? Right? That that was always my question. If it's not your responsibility, whose is it? And it was never clearly defined, which meant that Wilson... and took a lot of credit when signings came in at the time, by the way, and he thought they were going to work and then ran for cover when they didn't. Um, it, it's Niels Coppin. If, it, if the players do well, he gets credit. If the players do badly, he gets blame. That, to me, seems much more straightforward. Everyone knows. And I also think you need somebody who can fully concentrate on it because there's so much going on, especially when you are looking for bargains the way we are. So somebody dedicated and full-time to it, I think, is a good idea. But... It's everything else at the club. And it's coordinating everything at the club. And it's somebody who can do the legwork in terms of moving players out the door, who can look ahead two, three years, who can plan ahead, who can look at the youth system, who can look at the coaching at Rangers. Because everything should constantly be getting monitored, even if it had been going well. Right, okay, it's been going well, but what are we doing? Somebody who should be out there looking at the rest of football, finding out what's going on, what are the trends, what's the next thing coming, how can we get ahead of it, how can we get, you know, all of these things. So I think you do need someone in there to do that. 
David Clapperton, there's been plenty said about our keeper in defence collectively and individually, but do they get enough credit? We don't score or create anyone near enough chances and goals, so the games are always alive at the latter stages. This means the goalkeeper and defenders need to be inch perfect all the time. That's massive pressure on every game for them to play under. Also, in my opinion, it's the same reason that we can't bleed more young players into the first team as well. The lack of quality in forward areas means we don't put games away. Couldn't agree more on that point. And we were talking about this on the flagship a couple of weeks ago, that if you know, you think about it, there are games over a season that you should be able to basically slow down from about 60 minutes if you're Rangers because you're three up, you know, four up. And that just doesn't seem to be the case, which means you're playing at high octane for 90 minutes, which is going to have an effect on the legs throughout the season, right? You don't have those time in game to, to take, and as you say, to make changes and shove kids on, etc. I think the defence domestically has been doing, has been doing well. I thought it was great in Malmo as well, actually, so not just domestically. Um, I think the uh, our defence's main issue is that it has a problem with really quick players, and that's been shown in the Celtic and uh, Leon games against you know higher quality than they usually face. But domestically, now they've been fine. Jack's been kind of back to what he was at the first six months of last season rather than the last three. I think John Souter is in the best spell of his Rangers career. Uh, him and Proper seem to have an understanding. jeffy has been very, very good. I think tab has been, been anywhere near what he used to be. I don't think he offers as much going forward anymore. But defensively, again, with the exception of games where we're up against real pace, he's been okay. Um, I really like the look of Cassian Vero. For me, I'd be getting him in the team. Um, because every time he's come in... It, it it's not just that it, a bit like Jeff he's got a calmness about him where he just does he just does defending he just goes and does it right there's no histrionics but there's no sense of him ever being in danger and I love that that calmness he exudes because that translates to the rest of the team and more importantly it translates to the support as well rather than guys who look a bit panicked so yeah I think the defence has been doing okay but again it, it gets judged in the bigger tests and they haven't been going quite as well Ali Keith, with a manager in his position a year tomorrow, how do you rate the job he's done so far? Me, I would say 6 out of 10. He clearly never got all the players he was after in the summer, but he's going to need at least two, maybe another three transfer windows to bring in quality players and the board support him and the fans give him time. Yeah, I think that's fair. First six months, I thought, wow, here we go. You know, this is incredible. Um, And then there was that dip and there has been a, you know, the, the lingering issue from that, you know, the, the way the season ended, which bled into this season. Not helped, it must be said, by not being able to play our fucking home games at Hamden, or, or having to play our home games at Hamden, not being able to play our own stadium. Uh, all of that worked against him, but he's he's kept an even keel, you know, he's kept his head throughout it, I think. Um, I think he, he, he knows that he's, you know, there for a bit, he's, he's not going out the door anytime soon which is enabling him to to make decisions that hopefully will be right for us in the long term. But yeah, it's been an up and down year. I think he'd probably be the first to admit that himself. Andrew Hillis, hi David, hope you're well in what feels like the longest ever international break. Hopefully not too controversial, but in my opinion we are far too easy to play through our midfield. The effort is definitely there, but most of them are too lightweight, small and don't control or create enough. Unfortunately we are in danger of overestimating their abilities when we don't defend well enough at the back or score enough up front. Despite having Alex Ray in the coaching team, do you think we don't seem to recognise we need some big athletic bastards in the middle of the park? Yes, <laughs> I think we could do with um. It's it, like I say, long term gripe of mine. Um, pace, athleticism, dynamism. I think the team lacks it, and not merely in the middle of the park. I think we lack it all over the park, uh, and it can cost us at time. I feel for Connor Barron at times because there have been times this season he's been left two on one and he's trying to do the job of two people, and. That is is not easy. I think we need a better balance in there. I don't think we have necessarily the player on the books. I know the manager's been trying a few in there, but I think we need that's a key position for me in the January window to bring in a midfielder, even on loan to get to the summer and then bring in, you know, but we need someone to come in and do that. And I don't think the balance of our midfield is right in certain matches, um, particularly against Celtic, where I think we're going to need more in the engine room than, than we currently have. But again, I'm not sure we have the players there who who can who can come in and, and change that for us. I think we'll need to go external. 
Kim McGinn says, Hi David, I hope you're well. What positions can you see the club recruit players for in January? Centre mid, absolutely, I think. A number six, as Adam would call it, um, is is key. I think that's a priority. Um, I think that the club would also like uh, uh, another uh, wide player to come in, purely, as I say, just you know for competition in there. So I could see that happening. Uh, I would like a striker, but I don't think we'll get one. And the reason for that is that we currently have three. My argument is that one's a kid and, you know, is, is just being introduced into football at this level. One has long-term and consistent injury problems, so can't be relied on. And one has been run into the ground because he's playing all the time. And I, I think that affects Dessel's style. I don't think Dessel's a great player, by the way, just in case anyone misunderstands me. But I don't think he would get quite as much negativity around him if he was having to play every single minute of every single game which it kind of feels like at the moment you know there are games it, it, it really struck home at me when we played Kiev uh, uh, Hamden and he, he, he was hopeless that night right I mean he, he he couldn't have controlled the football with a pitchfork it was you know it was bouncing off and he was like a pinball machine and under normal circumstances if we had another option he gets subbed after 60 minutes maybe earlier and the other striker comes on. But instead, he has to play right through to the end where he makes another half hour of those mistakes. And fans' frustration goes from frustration to absolute, you know, just sheer anger. Um, not entirely his fault. So I would like another striker. Don't think we'll get it. Stephen says, Hi David, I'd love to know your thoughts on this team's current setup. We clearly play a system that is reliant on our two attacking wingers assisting a solitary attacker that plays through the middle, but we don't appear to have the personnel. Should we keep persevering with a system that simply doesn't have the players required to make this effective? Not for a, a minute suggesting it made us all conquering when the team loses its head. Um, please don't read into that. Uh, I dig it at the captain. It's not what it is. Just wondering what your own thoughts were. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's a fairly legit thing. I mentioned earlier, I, I would look at other systems because I think if we had other systems, it would give us a little bit more uh, freedom in terms of certain matches, a little bit more security in certain others. And I'm not, by the way, totally ruling out the 4 2 3 one ever getting played. There are games that's absolutely ideal, especially with a number 10. Games are going to dominate possession and hopefully create a lot of chances. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would look at it and say, right, okay, we're playing against this team who are dominant in the middle of the park. Let's go man for man with their attack. And, you know, just, just different things. But, you know, I'm not a professional and I'm sure the manager could give me a hundred technical reasons as to why I am talking out of my arse. So there's always that. But yeah, I wouldn't mind it seen as being a wee bit more flexible. Hi David, hope you're well. What would be your thoughts on Rangers becoming closely affiliated with an elite level club? This would help with scouting and coaching but undoubtedly would mean that we would get players on loan we may not have ordinarily wanted. With our finances being extremely limited, this could be an option but ideally not something we would consider if we were to have a player trading model in place. Yeah. Um, I just don't think fans would accept it. And it really is that simple. I just don't think the, the fans would accept it. Because there is also a difference between, as you say, elite leagues and Rangers could be seen as, if you like, a feeder club to what by any perception is a smaller club but richer because of the league they play in, then I don't think fans would wear it. You know, if we're starved of success for a while longer, then maybe we'll, we'd be prepared to look at anything like that, but I just, you know, don't don't see it happening, to be honest. You can have unofficial tie-ups right enough. Um, with clubs where you explore a mutually beneficial relationship and that to me just seems common sense you can do that without necessarily having to commit to something that's that's in but it's yeah you know, I just don't I just don't think the vast majority of our fan base would take to it but uh, yeah I'm, I'm I'm willing to to be argued against if, if those of you out there say no David actually I, I wouldn't give a toss I'm all for it uh, please let me know Stuart McKenzie, we generally can't develop real elite talent because they'll get poached at 16 for half a million. We can't afford real elite talent when they're older. We can afford the best talent in Scotland from other SPFL teams, which over the years has proven to be enough to make us successful domestically, especially when sprinkled with a few overseas players. Look at the team which won away to Leon and generally throughout what second spell. Isn't it time to forget about the B team and spend the money each year on the Lennon Millers and Josh Doigs of this world? I suggested something similar, Stuart, where I said, should you be spending, say, 3 million? a year on the academy 
when you could take that three million and every year say, right, we're going to buy the most promising young players in the SPFL with this money. And if there's none, we'll put the money away the following year, right? And this summer, for example, you go out and you sign Lennon Miller and uh, David Watson. Now, firstly, there is a concern because UEFA really like clubs to have an academy and it's very helpful with FFP if you want to play at the top level. So there's that consideration there. So is there a kind of halfway house between the two? All I'll say is at the moment, I don't think it's working and I think it's going to get more difficult, as I spoke about earlier and as you mentioned, because all our best ones get poached. Not just us, by the way. You know, we had our uh, Billy Gilmer and we had the lad that went to Villa, Celtic and Ben Doak, right? It happens to every club in the SPFL. So I think we need to look at radical solutions to this. And in an ideal world, the clubs would get together and discuss it, but there are you know, no adults in the room there, so um, they, they don't bother with things that might long-term help the league and the, the country in general. But yeah, I, I, I definitely think that it's something we have to look at. Right then, folks, thank you so much to our CEOs for those questions. Some excellent ones there, some thought-provoking ones. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back with a normal one next week, this time next week, uh, after Rangers travel to Rugby Park. In the meantime, can I please point you in the direction of our Patreon site? Yes, patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. Up to five shows every single day on the Heartland Network on all things Rangers, plus other football, plus some other things. You will get entertainment and you'll certainly get bang for your buck over there thank you for listening to me uh, thanks to our producers in london mike lee and paul miles and uh, i'll talk to you again next week till then folks have a good one take care everyone bye bye